Um, I'm very happy uh, to welcome Anastasia, who is going to be talking to us about continuous documentation of Python code. Uh, Python code. Anastasia is working as head of engineering. Uh, she has plenty of experience with the things she's going to be talking about. She also organizes uh, Ber uh, uh, in Berlin, she organizes Python meetups, and we are very excited to welcome her here. Welcome, Anastasia. Hello, everyone. Oh, it's so great to be in an in-person conference. Actually, um, I'm super excited to talk about my experience, about documentation, and based on the questions from the previous talk, it could be also useful for you. It's like a continuation of the previous experience because I'm gonna focus on the documentation and there were already great tips given how to start with documentation, how to have the readme, and this would be more like a um, nice continuation with how to maintain your documentation and how to take care of the documentation. So a few words about myself. Um, I am Ukrainian. I am living and working in Berlin for already six years, and I'm an organizer of the Pi Berlin Meetup. You're all invited. You can come anytime to Berlin and then enjoy the beautiful community meetup. I have already 11 years of experience in software development, and from those 11 years, I have seven years in Python, so you can imagine how happy I am with Python that stayed so many years. In the previous experience, I was a C++ developer. That was fun, and Python um, is more welcoming. The community uh, is different, as you can imagine, and I'm still happy not writing uh, so much Python recently, but helping teams to set up many things, also um, best practices in the teams. And one of the topics that I really like is the documentation. So as it's in-person event, I can actually ask the question and see the answers. Do you really document your code? Raise the hand if you do document your code. Oh, wow, so many, almost everyone. 90% 90. <laughs> 90 of the people. <laughs> Great, so let me tell you a story. I remember myself some time ago, around 10 years ago, when I just started, I wrote my first program, well, in C++. Just step by step, I took the book, I started, wrote it, it was perfect, it looked so perfect, or I thought it was perfect. But it didn't feel that right, it did not feel finished, and at that point, since I didn't have so much experience, I didn't know what to actually check in my code how to know when that code that I wrote is good enough or when it needs a bit more work to be ready to go into the code review even, even before the code review. And when I passed the code review and it was merged to the main branch, I was not really sure if this code was, will be still great in let's say like five or six years or even in one year, if it's gonna be still surviving so I didn't have documentation. It was not written in the manuals or uh, the guides in the book that you have to add some documentation. And just 10 years later, I realized that confidence with the code and with everything that you're doing comes with experience, with failures and successes, with learning from others, also attending conferences, also trying different approaches, but what if you could possibly travel to the future and then ask your future self how to make this code better? In this talk, we will try to experience this to ask your future selves and then see what happens. So let the future begin now. So let's start the story with a sad little code. This, this piece is really, really sad. And um, it was a bit lost in its lifetime. No one wanted to play with the set code. And the code was wondering if there is a possibility to improve, to find out what's actually wrong and how to talk with new people, with new services, uh, how to talk to others, how to get new friends and how to look into the issues it was experiencing. And the set code had so many questions about the lifetime but there were no answers. It was just a really sad cat sitting next to the set code. So such a sad story. The set code was really wondering what's wrong. 
how to find the friends. Let's take a look. The first piece of code, as you can see, it's a happy code, the hello world. You know that already by the book, looks perfect. But the next one could be a bit problematic, a bit sad, I would say. You can see that there is a function, there are parameters, there is something going on inside, but there is no clue what's going on, actually. What does this endpoint do? What does it return? What the parameters do? Really no clue. That's why this code is really sad. And you remember the beginning of the story, the sad code was sitting alone and there was a sad cat. So the code went to sleep and something truly magical happened. It met someone, it met the future self. And the future self said, I will give you four pieces of advice which will improve your communication skills and at the end, you will have to solve a riddle. So follow my advice to reclaim the ancient knowledge and gain the programming superpower and you will shine for, shine for many, many years. So let's start and listen carefully. And the sad code, of course, yes, please continue. So the first advice showed the sad code how to use the problem-oriented approach to show the world how to solve a problem if there are any in the future. So this um, approach includes writing the how-to guides. Those are the guides. They're pretty similar to having a go-through for a specific problem. So you have the problem, you go through it with not so many explanations, with not so many details. You um, don't have to really explain the basics. You just need to go through. So it's more like learning through doing some how to guides, starting and then finishing like I did by the book in the beginning. So this could be also adding the readme, but as the previous speaker mentioned, don't um, abuse the readme as a how to guide. It could be a how to guide how to install the application. That's it. If you have other how to guides, just uh, use the other um, supporting documents. So this could be a good start. And after following the first advice, the set code noticed that they got a friend. Can you imagine a new friend? How do I do? How do I know that? Look, there is a friend. There is one star already shining. So <laughs> let's go to the second advice. The second advice showed the set code how to use the learning oriented approach, how to show what the code is actually doing. This is about the instructions with clear step, steps that are needed to be done in order to build something, to achieve some goal. So this is from the beginning to the end to already create some project. I like the previous one, which was a small steps. It was like a small task to do. This would be more of um, teaching somebody, like a workshop, for example. You don't focus on the outcome specifically, you focus on the process of learning. So that's when you have a teacher who is showing you how to do, what to do, the process is important, not the outcome specifically. And by following this advice, you can basically add some tutorials, how to set up the documentation, for example. And something new happened. I got another friend. Look, there are more stars already if this is the open source. And the third advice showed the set code how to use understanding-oriented approach to explain the world more about its personality and about how the code feels about other services and packages and even about integrating with others. So this is to add more information on the top of what you have, on the top of the how-to guides and the tutorials, some explanations, why are we doing the specific approach, why the architecture is like that. It's not documenting the decisions, but more explaining the approach that you are taking. For example, it could look like this. Why do we need documentation and then motivation, explanation, and you got more friends and even more friends. That's already great. So the last but not least advice showed the code how to use information-oriented approach. That's about the code reference. Code reference guides includes um, 
also definitions of the functions of the APIs, describing the classes, uh, all the parameters, basically everything that could be useful to broaden the knowledge about the code that you're writing. Could look like this. You could also use uh, Sphinx, for example, to generate that um, automatically to go through the code, to um, use all the doc strings to generate beautiful knowledge base about your code that you're writing. And we will see this part, how it works, in the demo a bit later. So as you remember in the beginning, the um, future self said that in the end you will have to solve the riddle. So after those four wonderful advices from the future, something really magic happened. The code woke up and was not sad anymore. It has uh, all the nice feelings about talking to others and then um, go outside, go into the wild, go into open source maybe. And a few years later, it met its creator, the developer, and there was a sparkle of understanding between them. They felt deeply con connected even after a few years that this code was online. And at that moment, the code had a flashback in memory to that moment when um, the creator said that, remember that I will give you a riddle to solve and you will gain a superpower. So let's take a look at that one. Here's the riddle. I'm someone who can teach you a lesson, but not a teacher. I'm someone who can guide you to a goal, but not a tour guide. I'm someone who can tell you everything about technical specs of your functions, but not an encyclopedia. And I'm someone who can explain you a particular topic to help you to understand, but not Google. Any ideas? what this could be? Happy silence. Everyone is extremely happy listening to this talk. <laughs> okay, so the code started thinking and finally realized something. So wait, was it all about you? It was about me. So you are my future self. So are you actually a documentation? Yes, there is a secret that uh, you have to understand that there is no one single documentation. There are four different types of documentation and they consist, like they put together the entire documentation for you. So all of those advices were about me and you, about the code and the future self. Those were about tutorials, how-to guides, explanation and the reference guides. the code reference, of course, the simple setup as the readme, the how-to guides, the tutorials, and the more deep explanation would make your code happy. You will have a really happy code and even the cat could be happy in the end. And you can get so, so many friends in that because everyone would understand what the code does and maybe you will get many contributors into the code which would be fantastic. So let the future begin now. Let's start writing documentation. So um, I have a question, which is a follow-up. Would you document your code knowing its future, knowing that documentation can make your code shine for many years? But since you're already documenting the code, maybe this talk is for you to improve documentation. But if this example, for example, didn't, commit you, uh, didn't convince you to start working on documentation, I have a few more bites of advice from my experience. Why do you actually need to document the code? The first one from my experience is that people forget things. People actually don't have to remember everything. So as, as you wrote the first piece of code, it was perfect. You knew everything, every single line of that code you knew how it works, but then in even a month, you went on vacation, you went outside of the writing that piece of code, or even you switched to a different feature, and then suddenly you don't remember anything. That's the first use case. And then people leave the code alone. That's basically the same. Even if you are writing that code, you know that you're working on that feature for a really long time, and then suddenly you decided to uh, switch the team or 
exactly went on vacation, decided to go out a bit to relax. And still the code is alone. And when you are back to the same feature writing, you don't remember how it works anymore. And new people are coming to contribute. For the companies, for the open source, new people who are not familiar with the code, they don't really know what were you trying to achieve by writing this piece of code. It would be really nice to have at least the installation guide in between how to run this code and maybe a bit more of a code reference, what the, the code actually does and uh, how to contribute more into the code. So if you really decided to start adding some documentation to your code or write code um, and document it on the way that you're writing, here are a few checks to make sure that you're on the right track. First one, you need to go simple. You need to choose the main source tool for documentation. It could be anything. Um, you can use the code actually to write uh, some maybe markdown files, or you can choose also config. So any tool that works for you and your team. But then you have to make sure that it's up to date because if you start writing the, the code, it's not possible that it's the same in like a year or five, five years. So you need to really take care of the documentation and make sure that every time you write a piece of code, you check the documentation which is related to this code. So I recommend you to read a few articles to get more inspiration and maybe um, more deeper knowledge about what we talked about today. So the first one, it was about different types of documentation and more with examples, what each type includes and what can you actually write as those pieces uh, of documentation. And then the other one is uh, about where to put your documentation. So what kind of documentation goes where? So how to actually start? I would recommend you if you don't have documentation or maybe you have already some documentation to start as simple as possible, just any, any documentation that you can write, just write it. And then as a next step, you need to go to the version controlled documentation. So then every time you release a new version, you have documentation specifically for this piece. Because if you have different versions, you might need to go back and then check what was it doing. How to actually do that if you have some Python code? I did try Sphinx. It worked pretty nicely. When you generate the, um, all the code, references, and uh, all actual documentation from the code, when it's already connected to the code, it's nice to connect it to code review. For example, you have um, a, a piece of code review which is adding a feature or modifying the feature. You can already check what um, if developer added documentation, changed documentation or not. So it could be also a part of code review. And then you can try read the docs. That's a fantastic tool. It's not only generating the files, but also hosting them and you can go to version control. I have a bit of a demo for you for simple documentation. If you want to see the code, how to set up the Sphinx documentation and how to write those pieces of documentation, it's all there. You can uh, check the link. I'm going to show you probably in a second. So let's say we decided to go with read the docs. Anyways, it's super simple. You just log in. There is a read the docs.com for companies, that's the paid for version. And there is a readthedocs.org, that's a free open source one. So if your uh, source is open, you don't wanna pay, you just wanna have documentation already hosted, it's gonna be a bit slower. So there is no priority in supporting you, of course, um, but it's free and nice and you have all documentation, all different setups. You can just uh, log in with your GitHub account and then uh, export the documentation, then run it, few clicks, it's done. Easy. And it's gonna look like this. Beautiful, easy, searchable, you can export in, into PDF, HTML, any format you like. So there is a bit of a problem. You can force people to write documentation. There are different tools for this. 
but you cannot really force people to read documentation. So the reading documentation is really hard. <laughs> you can also add uh, some CI steps to check whether each code piece has enough documentation, has enough doc strings, uh, has enough uh, um, documentation reference. But to read documentation, that's a cultural thing. So that's something that you need to have in the team. You need to have this habit of um, starting reading documentation. If the team doesn't, you can start yourself and then everyone will follow. But how will they follow if they don't read it? Simple, you can just start sending them, how about you read this documentation? It's already documented. So if, when you start sending the links to people, they would probably search there first before asking you. So I wanted to show something. Let's see. Okay, it works. So this is uh, the repo where you can see different setups. There is also a workflow here for documentation. So there is one tool which is called interrogate which checks how many lines of code are documented. Yeah, this one, line 32. So this could help you to force people to write documentation but not to read. Yeah. And this is how the read the docs hosted solution already looks. There is a version on the bottom, and this is actually everything that I showed you. It's already hosted. It has the search. It has all the documentation, all the code, code reference, all the information. And this is the website for the reference to read more about documentation. Okay, um, if you want to read a bit more about how to set up, there is a website, there is uh, one small article about this. Also, you can check this repo with the simple docs setup and you're all invited to the next meetup. I would like to really hear from you the feedback and if you have any questions, you can reach out to me on Twitter. Thank you so much, Anastasia. And now let's jump, jump into the questions. So the one with the most upvotes. Do you consider tests to be a type of documentation? Well, actually not. As you saw different types of documentations, tests are not there. You can force people to write tests as well, but documentation is not about testing the software. It's about document, documenting what does it do. The next one. What are some, ty what are some, uh, some of your favorite publicly available examples of projects that implement your four tips? Yes, basically the link that I shared before, the Divio, that's uh, the company that created the entire structure and they have this entire documentation for their projects. You can go and check it out, like go through the website. So there is a website of the company and the website with the documentation about documentation. So both. Thank you. How do you make sure that documentation stays in sync with the code? Well, that's a, a great question. Uh, quite challenging. Um, you read documentation. <laughs> Actually, I don't have a perfect solution, so that has to be a culture in the team, that the team is interested in updating documentation. That's the only um, possibility. So there are tools to force documenting the code to generate the code reference. So that's the only thing that you can do, um, but not the updating documentation if it's like in the text format, for example. If you change one line, the interrogate tool will go and tell you, you need to yeah, update this line as well. But uh, yeah, with some custom written documentation, like tutorials, how-to guides, you really need to make sure that the team understands why it's needed and then they update it. The next one is about, again, sort of culture or even politics. Um, how would you persuade a company 
to have the whole docs within a Git repository with versioning, reviews, uh, text like format, instead of having it spread out in co Confluence and company? Oh, that's a tough question. A great one, but tough. Um, well, we have both, actually. It doesn't mean that you have to have only one type of documentation. It depends how you use it. If you are fine with searching in two uh, places, then it's fine. So the way how um, we make, we uh, write documentation in the code when it's really related to the code. But for example, we document the decisions, some architectural also topics in Confluence. So we have different purposes for different tool for documentation. And then everyone knows if it's a code reference, they go to the code and then they check it. If it's a how-to guide, how to install the application, you also go to the code and check it. If it's a readme, you also go to the code and check it. But if it's something that is uh, more broad, more high level, then it's a confluence. So it's up to you to make a case and then to show that the way to go is to have one single place for everything that is related to the code. But everything else, I don't think that it makes much sense if you have all the architectural possible decisions in the code base, because maybe you have a lot of them. Thank you. Uh, now, this one is about choosing between two evils, not having any doc documentation at all or wrong documentation, out of sync or out of date. Oh my, all the tricky questions today. Um, well, I don't know. I don't have a strong opinion. Uh, both are bad. No documentation is uh, terrible, but uh, wrong documentation is also terrible. So it's up to, up to developers to actually convince uh, other developers that you need documentation, you really need documentation. Um, and yeah, I would suggest you to focus on something that will bring you more energy to the team and reading documentation and improve um, your team experience instead of having something that would, I don't know, decrease your productivity like no documentation or bad documentation. Well, it's not the bad documentation that decreases productivity. The old documentation decreases productivity. Because when you're trying to debug something, you're searching for solutions or like some clue, and then you need to either search documentation and then try it again, or you need to ask people around. So asking people around also is interrupting their time. And yeah, um, it's better to have documentation, at least some up-to-date documentation. Okay, uh, and kind of related, how do you ensure correctness of the docs? Oh, that's a, an easy question. You just do code review on the documentation. I mean, documentation review. If it's in the code, you do the code review, so you can read documentation during the code review process. Or you can also comment documentation after it's published. So then I don't think that there is a benefit silently submitting documentation and not really asking anyone to read. I think the benefit is when everyone is aware where to look for documentation and what is actually written. So you can ask people to go through documentation and check it out. That's a very powerful idea, reviewing not just the code, but also reviewing documentation. Yes. Um, do you recommend tests for documentation? And I would extend that. If so, what kind of tests would you suggest? Tests for documentation, never heard of that. I don't know, never tried it. Are there any tests? For documentation, I have no. no idea. But one thing that you just gave, one idea you just gave to me is that by reviewing documentation was that um, you know maybe if something hasn't been changed in a year, look at it if it's still current. I don't know. I don't know who asked it. Maybe you could clarify who asked it. Uh, this kind of test, not the test test, but how to make sure the documentation is up to date. Um, well, the tools and. I don't know that, that, how to test documentation if it's right. And the newcomer, you can hire a new person when they uh, start <laughs> their onboarding process. You can <laughs> ask them to follow the guide and you can ask them to fix the problems. And that, this also that, sounds like, oh. <laughs> that, could be, that could be a first task, a great first task as well. And this also sounds like a wonderful thing we can continue talking about while we go for lunch. So um, before, we, before we all uh, go, let's give a big hand to Anastasia. Thank you.
Kabit je programovateľný mini počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomer. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládať tak, že ňou zatraciem alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.